Transformative Principle, episode 111 with Frederick Lane. Today, I am really excited to have Frederick Lane on the podcast again. We are continuing the conversation from last week and talking about ways that schools and teachers can be safe and stay away from cyber traps for educators. This is a great interview, and I learned so much and continue talking to Fred long after the podcast was over because it is such a fascinating conversation and he is such an engaging person. I hope that as you listen to this, you will find ways to help your school, help your teachers, help yourself be a better communicator and to make sure you're staying within professional boundaries to give yourself and your students the best shot at a positive future. If you'd like to learn about all the things that I've learned from doing this podcast, please sign up for the newsletter and I'll send you the top five ways you can be a transformative principal. I'm less concerned about teachers communicating directly with parents. I actually don't think that that's a huge problem unless there's some argument going on or some major disagreement because, you know, they're adults. Theoretically, people can hold civil conversations. But if any teacher is listening to this and they are engaged in a digital communication or digital conversation with parents that is starting to get ugly, then they need to have the mindfulness to step back and get someone else involved in that conversation. So, you know, if, the, if there's some disagreement, getting a uh, principal involved, you know, and, and with all of these communication methods, there's, there's not a lot of problem with including other people in the conversation. Or if for some reason you're using a form of communication that doesn't make that easy, stop using it and use something else like email with CC or group text messaging or group Facebook messaging. We have so many options that there's no reason uh, not to use them. That, I think, goes triple for students. My, my general rule of thumb, and I feel pretty strongly about this, is no unmediated electronic communication between a teacher and a student. It, it just is too fraught with peril. And, and I think that teachers who, who argue against that, you know, I think that they're really running a risk of, of letting the student get too close, creating that false sense of intimacy, oversharing personal information. I, you know, again, having had teachers in my family, I absolutely understand the situation in which a student looks to the teacher as a confidant, as someone who can help with a situation they don't feel that they can discuss with anyone else. But given the risks in terms of electronic communication, I still think it's vitally important that the teacher always include a colleague, a superior, parents if it's appropriate, a school counselor if it's not, someone else on that conversation, even if they're just a passive listener, to make sure that there are no problems, that, that there's no sliding down that slope that we're concerned about. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. Well, and, and again, you know, think of the two things. As you pointed out, you want your teachers to be humans. You want them to have an empathetic relationship. My argument is that that the mediation of digital technology inherently strips out that humanity. So why not make it safe? And if you need to have that empathetic conversation with a student, do it in person. And obviously, again, under circumstances that are not creating, you know, the appearance of impropriety. But but if it's that serious a conversation, then you shouldn't be doing it digitally. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And as you're talking, I'm thinking of of situations that I've experienced or as a as a principal or as a teacher and how how those things need that you need that that mediation right and mm -hmm. how how powerful that can be to just if you're texting a student and your principal is getting all the texts also you're not going to say something that's inappropriate hopefully right, <laughs> well, um, you do. And, right. but if you're doing that on your own and the conversation goes to a different task or a different topic then you need to be able to say that you know I've got an out and it's easy to have an out when there's a third party. Mm -hmm. It's not so easy to have an out when it's just you and the student. And I think that's a, a great idea. No unmediated electric 
electronic communication between a teacher and a student, that sounds like a really good way to keep yourself out of trouble all the time. Well, and I think, right, and I think you've stated it really well, Jethro. That's that's exactly what, you know, what I'm trying to get across here. And you know, I think if you if you combine it with what you had said earlier about the fact that we all recognize the, the value of the relationship between teacher and student, every single one of us, who's done anything in life can point back to a teacher who motivated them. And it wasn't someone who was aloof and cold and distant. It was a teacher that you really connected with. And I, I cannot underscore enough how much I agree with that, you know, how valuable that is. But <laughs> digital technology changes the landscape. It really does. Well, and it, it forces you, I think, to take extra steps to make that connection that you can make appropriately in person that you have to make inappropriately in digital communication that is like text messaging, right? Yes. So your tone of voice, your the empathy in your voice, the look on your face, your body language, appropriate touching, that kind of stuff, that solidifies a relationship in a healthy way. But without that, you have to resort to other means to to make that connection when you're texting with someone. Right. And keep in mind that you've got a generation gap. And, and, and let me put a pin in that for a sec, because that's, that's another issue. But generally speaking, you've got a generation gap in terms of users of digital technology. So if you have an older teacher who's communicating in that fashion with a younger student, they're almost speaking different languages. And their interpretation of what's being said or typed and how it's being said can be very, very different. And there's a huge risk for misunderstanding. And as you correctly point out, no facial cues, no expression, no tone of voice, none of that. And that also adds to the potential problem. Now, the thing that I was putting a pin in, though, is that an area that I'm spending a lot of time working on is developing teacher certification materials so that people who are going through and trying to become teachers understand that their role, and many of these are millennials, that their role as, as a student and as a young professional uh, are very different. And many of the cases that I write about in my blog are teachers who are in their early 20s who are still caught up in the mindset of all the time digital social media immersion and given the fact that they're physically not much older than their students and they're still in that same social media space, it, the potential for problems is enormous. You know, so how, how many times do you see the headline, you know, 24 year old, 25 year old teacher is involved in an inappropriate relationship with a 17 year old. It's, it's illegal. But when you look at the context of how it developed, it's, you know, basically two people from a technological point of view who are almost the same age. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I see that with teachers, with high school students and middle school students, with brand new teachers who are really not much older and they they haven't established their own professional identity yet. Yes. Because they're so new and they don't really know what that needs to look like. So, <laughs> right. That's a, that's a good way to put it. So things like friending students on Facebook and following students on Twitter or some of the other social networks, you and I are both on Twitter and both of our profiles are public. And so yes. kids can get information about us. What are your suggestions and tips for educators who want to be on social media and understanding that they're opening up a door. I think that that's, that's an interesting challenge. Look, you know, there's a couple of different ways that they can go about doing it. For starters, take whatever steps are necessary to make it difficult for them to be found. You know, there are certainly a lot of privacy settings now that are much more effective than they used to be. And so, I would strongly recommend to teachers that are putting personal information onto social media that they limit, number one, the places that they do that, and then secondly, that they make their accounts as private as possible. For instance, with Instagram, 
uh, you can set your account as private and you have to approve who actually gets access to your feed. Uh, Facebook is a little bit more difficult to do that with, but you can, you can strictly limit who can see uh, the material that you have there. The other thing that I think is important for educators and frankly all professionals to think about is to make sure that they select different social media channels for different information. So, for instance, for your teachers, I think it would be absolutely appropriate for them to have a very public LinkedIn profile that is focused on their professional work, you know, that makes it clear what their areas of specialty are, et cetera, et cetera. They can do, you know, posts that are appropriate for the work that they're doing. And that actually, I think, is a useful role model thing for students, right, to see what it's like to set up a uh, professional, outwardly facing social media account. On the private side, again, indicating to students that there's a distinction between the teacher's professional work in the classroom and their private life, and that's not a place students should go, is an important lesson to teach. So those are the things that I would really recommend for teachers. I, Again, with millennials, there's that sense of you know openness. Let's just throw it all out there. And it's difficult sometimes to pull stuff back. That's, that's another challenge. But it's also difficult to get them to change their mindset. And that's part of what we need to do. Yeah. And, you know, the other aspect is that I use um, Twitter, especially for my own personal branding and stating, you know, who I am. And I use it mostly for professional purposes. And even that can get you into trouble sometimes. I want to share a quick story about something that happened when Twitter first came out. When, when I first joined Twitter, I posted something that was totally inappropriate to post. And I said, I have a fire drill with my worst class today or something like that. <laughs> and right. not thinking, I had that pulled into my blog. And so on the sidebar that was showing up on my blog, which was linked to my school website where I had all my students go for assignments. And the next day after that fire drill, my whole class was really upset and frustrated. And I could just tell that they were being super snide and very disrespectful. And I was all offended that, you know, these kids were treating me so horribly. And so I asked them, what, what's going on? Why are you guys acting like this? And then one kid had the guts to say, you said that we were your worst class and we're all mad about that. And I was like, what are you talking about? I never said you were my worst class. And then they said, yeah, you did on your blog. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, I didn't actually say it on my blog. I said on Twitter, which is linked, but I see, I see the, the issue. And they saw that as very offensive for good reason. Yeah. And I felt, I felt badly about that because that was not appropriate for me to do. And I didn't understand that that could be a a problem for me later. And so, you know, I, I wrote up a reflection about that on my blog. I apologized to the kids. I told them, you know, that was not right of me to do. And now I've lost your respect and trust. And you, you know that I think that you're a difficult class to work with. So now... <laughs> Right. <laughs> now that that's out there. What are we going to do about this? And that's interesting. Yeah, it took a lot of work for me to get that class to for us to have a professional relationship again. And that was a, a little thing that had a big impact on me personally, because, you know, now I know I'm not posting anything negative on Twitter or Facebook, because somebody's going to see it at some point, and it's just not worth it for them to take that out of context or to understand it completely right. And it, it's a painful thing to go through, but it was a good lesson for me to learn from those kids that they have feelings too. And the whole well, class yeah. was upset with me. Well, and you know, Jethro, that's a really brilliant example. For starters, it's it, it's great because the harmful impact is relatively minor minor in the long run. So exactly. It, it, makes, it makes it a much better teaching tool. But, you know, there's a couple of lessons that I would really underscore coming out from that. You know, number one is that kids will find it. You know, that people 
who are educators need to understand the the ferocious skill that kids have in finding material. They're obviously very curious about the people who have authority over them, who you know, with whom they spend hours and hours every day, and they're very gifted at digging stuff up online. And so, you know, teachers need to remember that. And then the other thing too is that if there's something out there, it will come out in one way or the other. And so teachers need to get ahead of the curve. I mean, a number of the examples that I talk about in Cyber Traps for Educators, and these are extreme examples, but, you know, there are people, for instance, who got involved in the adult industry years before and then decide to go into teaching. And they, you know, think, well, you know, I've taken a different path in life. You know, I'm moving on, that kind of thing. And time and time again, stuff resurfaces. And so you just need to get ahead of the curve in terms of, you know, talking to your school board or your principal or, or what have you, and it's hard. And that actually, by the way, is something that I, I think will change over time, is that we will be, because of the way the Internet has made us all feel at one time or another, um, I suspect employers will get a little bit more easygoing about these kinds of things. But again, you know, it, it helps if teachers get ahead of the game. Yeah, that is very important. And I, I really felt like writing a blog post and talking about that situation for me mm-hmm. needed to happen so that I could point to it and say, yes, I made a mistake. Here's how I made it better. And here are the other things you can't see. But here's the just as public response to the mistake that I made. And and I felt like that was what I had to do to to be able to move forward and not have that held against me for, sure. you know, yeah. the rest of my life. So and that was a great, a great lesson for kids, honestly. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> we'll, see. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. None of them are my Facebook friends now. And that was many years ago. So we'll see. Wow. How that goes. <laughs> well, it'll take time. <laughs> yeah. So the last question that I have is what can my listeners do to be a transformative principal in this area? It's, it's such a great question, uh, Jethro. I, I think that the, the simple answer is communication is the, the key to all of this. And, and I mean communication in, in several senses. I mean communication in terms of providing uh, educators in their school communities with the best and most updated information about what is happening with technology uh, it's information about how kids are using technology. If we want educators to avoid cyber traps, they need to know how those traps evolve. They need to know how they arise. And the more information that we give educators, the easier it will be for them to avoid what really can be career-threatening mistakes. So that piece of communication is important. Obviously, communicating Um, hopefully not an incident-driven based communication like you had, but communicating with students on a regular basis about their responsibilities, about the idea of digital citizenship. You know, the line that I use with people is that the golden rule can be updated, you know, having kids post unto others as they would have them post unto themselves. That's, that's a good place to start. You know, it doesn't cover every situation, but it, it really gets people thinking about how do they want to be treated online and How should they treat others? And then lastly, if you're really going to be a transformative principal, find a way to get the entire school community involved in this conversation. Because, again, I come back to the idea that parents who are horrendously challenged and overworked and honestly uh, in some ways frightened or or, or scared of, of what their kids can do with technology, they have this responsibility ultimately to provide the guiding principles that govern how their children behave. But they need help doing it. They need information. They need the support of the schools. So to the extent that a principal can be a moving force in that process, uh, that's a huge, huge contribution to the uh, school community at large. Yeah, that is really powerful. And that actually inspired another question. If you have a couple more minutes, is that all right? Please. Yeah, please go ahead. (laughs) One of the things that I think we need to address at least is that many schools are moving towards a one-to-one technology to student ratio. And this, when the school is providing the technology, brings up a whole nother issue of these cyber traps. 
What is your best advice for schools that are moving in that direction of how to um, maintain those boundaries? And I think you already answered it, but I just want to make sure we're talking specifically about when schools provide the technology. Well, when schools provide the technology, and I actually honestly think that that's becoming a little bit rarer because of the bring your own device approach to this whole issue. But when schools provide the technology, they need to play a very aggressive and I think firm role in monitoring what kinds of activity takes place on their equipment and on their network. And, you know, even as a big privacy advocate, I have absolutely no problem with schools saying to students, we're providing you this device. You need to be aware that we have virtually unlimited capability to examine what is being done. You need to understand that we monitor what kind of traffic flows through our networks. We, you know, maintain a record of what websites are visited and we block inappropriate ones as best we can. You know, it's not a perfect system, but that is part of our obligation in keeping you safe. And we take that obligation very seriously. The real problem, honestly, Jethro, that schools are facing is that kids are bringing cellular devices that bypass the, the school's network. And so those devices, I think, present much greater uh, challenges for school districts. There, your best recourse is in terms of ongoing education, very clear, acceptable use policies, and more education. Yeah. So it's a treadmill that is not easy to get ahead of. I absolutely understand that. But, you know, that that is the job we do as educators is, is we provide information and we hope some kids, hopefully most of them absorb it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for being on the podcast. What is a way that people can get in touch with you and learn more from you? That's that's great. Uh, my website, uh, www.frederiklane, F-R-E-D-E-R-I-C-K-L-A-N-E.com has information about all of my work, my lecturing, uh, and also has contact information uh, both by phone and by email. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time today. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Jethro. So a great interview with Fred Lane right there. Thank you so much for listening. And I really appreciate everybody who does listen. Please share this with those who you associate with, all the other principals and teachers. I think that this conversation is a very important one for us to have as educators we need to find a way to deal with these technology issues to help us be more successful and help our students. So thank you so much for listening. Please feel free to leave some comments on transformativeprinciple.org and share this with everybody you know. This podcast is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. Go to edupodcastnetwork.com.